You're watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. From Toronto, Ontario, I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Today, a conversation about literacy, financial literacy for Muslim women. But first, some news headlines. Online reporting tool for Freedom Convoy receives abusive and hateful messages. Anti-Semitic rhetoric still strong in Toronto convoy protests. British Columbia's Knowledge Network funds white productions, shows audit report. Heckled for hijab, Indian Muslim college girl says she is not scared. And now, the details. Since it launched on Friday, multiple abusive messages have been left on the online tool that allows people to report incidents of harassment concerning the Freedom Convoy. The tool was created by the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, or MWAC. Syed Hussain, MWAC's executive director, told local media sources that over 250 stories have come in, but most of them are racist and hateful. This is alongside a growing number of genuine reports, many of which come from racialized communities. In spite of the hateful messages, MWAC say they will keep the line open to support people. Hateful rhetoric, including displays of Nazi symbols, are still widely visible in the Freedom Convoy protests. On Twitter, Stephen Zhao wrote that he found a protester in Toronto with a sign saying that the Jews are behind COVID. Other protesters allegedly flocked to him and did not contradict him. Taha Rayur, the executive director of Justice for All Canada, said that such shameless displays of hate call for more stringent anti-hate regulations. NDP MPP to Julian tabled a bill proposing to ban the sale and display of hateful symbols last week. Critics worry this ban raised moral and legal issues, as it can move from banning opinions rather than criminal actions. Knowledge Network, British Columbia's public broadcaster, is being questioned after an internal audit revealed racial discrimination in which 98% of pre-licensed funds were given to white production companies in the last seven years. The remaining amount was allocated to companies operated by people of colour. Indigenous-led productions received no funding. Founder of the Vancouver Asian Film Festival and Racial Equity Screen Office, Barbara Lee, said that discrimination has harmed the careers of BIPOC producers. Knowledge Network President and CEO Rudy Boutignol told local media sources that he had major reservations with the audit. Last year, diversity was measured by directors and writers, not the company's owners. Muksan Khan, a Muslim girl from the Indian state of Karnataka, says that there is no need to fear. Khan became a symbol of Muslim women's resistance to protect their right to hijab earlier this week after she braved threats and confronted a mob of men with saffron shawls, a colour seen as a Hindu symbol and associated with the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party. In an exclusive interview with Anadolu Agency, Khan says she was not scared and remembered Allah when she confronted the mob. Protests over headscarves have escalated within the last week with multiple reports of violence and aggression. And that's it for the news. Some people are surprised when they receive the credit card statement that there's interest. It puts people into debt unexpectedly. And these days, money is something sort of unreal. We no longer handle cash. It's just a tap, tap, tap with the card. This makes financial literacy all the more important. With us today, we have Dr. Sanaba Siddiqui from the University of Regina Accounting Department, also a board member of the Islamic Association of Regina. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the show. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. You recently conducted a workshop for Nisa Homes, which is for Muslim women, a financial literacy workshop. What was the most important thing you told the participants? Um, it was a very interesting workshop. We spoke a lot about financial literacy and 
uh, the interplay with uh, Islam and the paradigm with which um, uh, Muslim women should uh, understand financial literacy literacy in the in the Canadian context. So it was a very interesting discussions with the participants. So that's that you've raised two very uh, interesting topics that I'll try to track. Uh, for the rest of the interview. Let's just start with the basics. What is financial literacy? So financial literacy are any tools, the knowledge skills that you have developed uh, to manage your finance. And how do you then live your life, um, uh, ensuring that uh, you are you make sound judgments as you go along the way, and then uh, and then that has a huge uh, interplay with our Islamic uh, understandings. So how do these two uh, merge, and what do we do uh, to ensure that we are following both the Islamic principles as well as um, you know being uh, making sound judgments as we you know uh, progress through our lives. Okay, so now that's the, that's the part. What what does that mean? Sound judgment Islamically. What when you're talking about merging financial literacy? So what what is that? So when I say that, I mean, um, and in the Canadian context, um, every step of the way, um, as a teenager, the minute you get into post secondary sector, you have to take a loan uh, to fund your uh, degree. So. Uh, you know, you are a young adult, 17, 18 year olds, and you already have a loan um, on you over um, four years. The, I mean, uh, graduate students have up to $60,000 loan. So an average loan for a student is $30,000 in Canada. So, um, and this has a huge, um, um, you know, issue with uh, people who follow Islam simply because we are, um, you know, we are told to avoid debt in whichever way possible or avoid interest. That's the word I'm looking for, um, simply because uh, we become, uh, we start our jobs and we are then actually, um, you know, paying interest for the rest of our lives. And then you graduate, you finish your degree, you get a job, you're paying interest, and then you want to buy a house. And again, uh, you have to get a mortgage to buy a house. So the whole paradigm is a clash with our Islamic faith because we are told uh, that interest is haram. And uh, then how do you make that balance, especially practicing Muslim, living in Western world where education as well as having a home and then having a retirement plan is all important. So this is a huge, uh, there's a huge scope for us to uh, teach our children or what to do, what not to do as they progress through their lives. And this is something that we discussed in the financial literacy workshop, actually. Okay, so let, let me try to just tease out a, a little bit more of that. I'm, I'm trying to put my grasp, but we have something called financial literacy, and this is something that everyone learns, you know, how to balance the books, how to not spend more than you earn, things like that. And now you have, you're bringing in this extra Islamic component. Muslims are, are supposed to avoid interest. Ha, ha, what, what are the ways to balance that thing? You said we can teach our children. So what, would, what should we be teaching our children? So this is a very difficult uh... Uh, balance to maintain. There is, there is no perfect solution. There is no perfect solution. And I am, I don't call myself a scholar in this area. I just follow really uh, smart people who have done a, a major work uh, uh, within financial literacy as well as the Islamic uh, paradigm. And then how do you make that gel? How do you cross that bridge? So, um, I mean, my, I mean, so we just have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, if we are taking a degree, we are, uh, we are, you know, take those four years to complete that degree. There are times and I've seen students who complete that degree within three years because they don't want their debt to pile. So if we know that this is wrong and uh, we need to avoid it uh, to the best of our, of our abilities, we need to have a very mm -hmm. sound uh, uh, decision when we are you know, choosing our degrees so that we finish them uh, in the most, uh, you know, smallest, uh, uh, in the least duration of time so that we are not uh, incurring debt and because the whole system has been made, the Canadian or the North American paradigm is such that um, uh, the middle class family cannot afford uh, any, uh, you know, undergrad or graduate degrees. So, you know, we are, um, uh, so it's, uh, it's a losing battle, actually. So we need to be very structured, uh, very decisive. We need to be very calculated that, okay, we are going to do this degree. We're going to try to do it in three years, three and a half years, 
four years, but we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't extend our time. The more time we spend in our post secondary sector, our debt is increasing. So it's a it's a spiraling, losing battle actually. And all the people at the workshop were they students? How many people attended? Oh, so it was a very small workshop. I had uh, about 15 uh, girls who attended. They were young girls. Uh, uh, so I had questions such as, should I be studying further? Um, uh, 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 so I had to counsel them that no, education is important. We shouldn't deter from taking education simply because there's an interest component of it. That would be going to the other extent. But we need to be you know so when we because we have i have seen personally as my capacity as an instructor at the university that students are not sure of which program they want to do they switch in the middle they really just keep elongating um uh, their time to uh, you know complete graduate the program and i believe one major factor because of this is is because you get so easily OSAP loans from the government. So the government is ready to pump in money on your education. Mm -hmm. But you forget that after six months of graduating, you really need to start paying everything back. So uh, if we have a much more structured uh, um, decision making power that we will do this as quickly as possible, I think uh, we would, you know, uh, limit the loan amount and have a plan or you know how are we going to come out of that uh, loan issue i've heard people who work in the social work sector saying that one of the major crises for immigrants is that they don't know how to use a credit card so did you also touch on those aspects or did you focus on the debt loan issue uh, no, so we spoke a lot about budgeting. So the first thing that we spoke about was budgeting. Uh, we start small since I had young girls. I had a few older women, but the uh, majority of them were um, about to get into university. So we had, so I spoke more about uh, the post secondary sector, but we spoke about budgeting. Then we spoke about investing. Um, uh, and then how do you use your credit cards? Uh, we also touched upon taxation. What does taxation have to do in, in, in all of this? And then basically having a better understanding about your financial um, uh, management, you know, your personal financial management and how do you, uh, you know, uh, increase your wealth? How do you invest safely and uh, through a halal perspective? actually uh yes so we all, we'd all like we all like to know how to invest and increase our wealth <laughs> do, you, do you have any tips uh no <laughs> again i follow um, I follow uh, learned members, uh, uh, and I really follow. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, there is no uh, halal per se uh, when you dive deep into the literature. So uh, I, I will refrain from taking any names at this point of time. Uh, we would have to do our own research. I can provide those resources for people who are interested to read some more, listen to some um, uh, authority figures in this in this area. But uh, there was question regarding uh, credit card cards and, uh, and uh, investing at the end of the workshop. We also spoke about uh, financial abuse and, uh, and um, uh, you know, marriage and death um, of your spouses. And then how do you navigate those territories? So uh, these were the kind of conversations we had in that uh, session, actually. And it, it, we're, we're almost out of time. There's about 30 seconds left. Do you think financial literacy is more or less important in the world of TAP without cash? No, it is very important simply because the whole system, especially the North American system, has been designed in such a way that everybody, everybody becomes, uh, you know, uh, a loan. Everybody is repaying back loan throughout the rest of their life. First, we start with the post-secondary. Uh, you're just paying off your degree loans. And then when you get when you want to buy a house, you have to pay. So they have uh, these are not uh, easily available in the grasp or a middle class family. You have to take uh, extra money. This was. This is not the situation. If you go back home to the other side of the world, uh, the, the setup is not. So right now in Canada, because of the debt ratio being so high, uh, an average family has over 156 or close to 200 thousand dollars debt per family in Canada. So uh, and we, we have are, to leave it there. We have to leave it there. But the key message is: don't get into debt if you can. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for this opportunity. You've been watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay safe. God bless.